Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the award-winning novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as the Hotel series. With me, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, Alison Martin, author of the Bourbon books. Hi, Jen. <laughs> hey. And we are joined today uh, by one of one of the authors we've been trying for months and months and months and months to get on our show. He's gracing us with his presence today, Mr. Keelan Patrick Burke. Welcome. Hi. Hey. Gracing you with my presence. Gracing us with your presence. Good thing I, I didn't trip over my royal robes while I was in the <laughs> You know, you never know. So Keelan, let's uh, have you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and about your latest book, which is The House on Abigail Lane. I don't do that very well. <laughs> then Me you don't either. have to. <laughs> no, when people wouldn't tell people about yourself. I'm like, I just Google it, you know? It's like, yeah. so, it, saves, it saves time and it's it's more, I think, I don't know succinct than I would make it. I'd be there going, what have I done? And there'd be long pauses. And I said, well, did I write that book or is that? Oh, no, wait, that was Josh that was Mallerman. It. Never mind. <laughs> well, that would be box. great. How about you tell us about Josh Mallerman? That's fine, too, if you'd rather talk Josh about him. Awesome. Josh is awesome, but he doesn't need me telling people about him either. He's, <laughs> he's, he's kind of well-known a little bit. He's on top of the world right now, yeah. 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 Well, and, guys, and to be fair, we did Google you, because I know I was Googling you for pictures, and there are all these handsome pictures of you in black and white looking very, very serious. So the fact that you've already smiled and looked more alive, it's already ruining the horror author mystique. You're going to have to work hard to bring that back. I know. I kind of used as my uh, inspiration Norwegian death metal bands. Yes! So, But because I didn't have the hair... Mm. I just had to. I just had to scowl in those pictures and go like, "Whatever you get into with me, you know it's going to be rough and dark and dangerous." Yeah. It so was, yeah, it's very disappointing when I go on these things. People are all like going. happy and smiling. Okay, and also to be fair, I was doing an image and Jen told me it was too happy, and I had to make the the colors less happy. I wanted the, the sunflowers too... scarier. But yeah, you can also, you wanted scarier you just... sunflowers, and I'm like, it's a sunflower, but I still try. But you just always, if you need an image of me, run a smiley one through Photoshop and just drag my mouth down with the, the <laughs> liquify thing. So, that would be horrifying. Don't do that. Next so time it's like you come uh, back. the Soundgarden video, Black Hole Sun. I'm all of a sudden, I'm just like, Whoa. we're not doing that, no. Oh, okay, cool. Or we could do like one of those reface apps and put your face on like a haunted Victorian baby. I am a haunted Victorian baby. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, so okay. You just so, told us everything we needed to know about you. I, you I was going to say, there's, there's baby. my bio. Yeah, I'm we a were, Victorian baby. As Jen said, we've tried to have you on a couple times. And the first time we tried to have you on, I tried to read one of your books. And after a few pages, I said, well, I eventually want to sleep again. So I took Blanky and said, this is not the book for me. So Haunted Victorian Baby. I don't think that's where that goes. But uh, I just, uh, I have three children and said, this is, mm. I, yeah, I don't think I can. One for parents. I'm glad that's yeah. where your sentence went, though, because I had a bit of a heart attack. I thought I tried to read your book once, and I got three or four pages in, and went, "No, this is dog shit." No, no, it was it was definitely already too intense, and I said, mm, "This is not the book for Allison," and just pushed it aside. And I, I asked Jen because I knew she was more of the expert in the genre. I don't <laughs> read a lot of horror unless she makes me. And do, she said, I do make read you. the house on Abigail Lane. And so I did. And now I'm traumatized by sunflowers, which I really didn't expect going in. But maybe we could talk about that and why. Yeah. What, like, it was one of my favorite flowers, <laughs> to be honest. And now... You want me to tell, to explain why you guys are terrified yeah. by sunflowers now? Yes, explain that. That seems to, to me too. that's something you guys should explain to me. I'll talk to my therapist about it later. But still, <laughs> was there a specific reason for sunflowers or why that ended up on the cover? Uh, the cover, yeah, because of how prominently it features in the in the book itself, as uh, you know, in connection with the sunflower god. But at the early stage of that, when I was writing it, and a character refers kind of in gibberish to the sunflower god, I didn't have any idea what that was. I just thought this guy's lost his shit. He's he's writing that. Okay, well, what is that then? And I had an impression by the end of it of what it was, but not a full impression of how or whether or not it had orchestrated everything that had come before. I think I kind of leave that up to the reader to figure out exactly if everything's connected or if nothing is. 
which is both, I think, its strength and a, a weakness. A lot, people, <laughs> a lot of people read it and they go, yeah, it was great, but what the hell? And other people, you know, kind of get where I meant for it to go, which is the whole idea that you have these documentaries where they basically delve really deep into unexplainable things. But the whole point of the program or the show or the series is to explain it. <laughs> if it's unexplainable, then how did they do that? Yeah, one of the <laughs> most unsolved mysteries tonight, we're going to talk about it and try to solve it. Uh, well, you know what? I kind of wanted the best of both worlds. I wanted to make it a documentary style story where it's an investigation and accumula accumulation of all the evidence that's been gathered over the years about this house that doesn't seem to really obey the laws of physics. And uh, as does frequently happen, and it, you know, sometimes I get accused of being lazy. Maybe I am and just don't know it. I'm too lazy to figure out whether I am or not. <laughs> is, um, is just that I bring it to a place where I am satisfied by how much of the mystery is resolved and how much is left up to your imagination. And some people like that, some people don't. Some people want it all spelled out, and I'm yeah. terrible at it. I hate that because I, I just think it presumes the reader needs you to take them by the hand and walk them through it. Yeah. And I, I hate when, I hate when books do that, so I don't do it. I love um, kind of I don't want to say vague endings, but endings that ambiguous that are mm -hmm. yeah, ambiguous. Yeah. That you you can read so many things into it, and I mean, if I read my Goodreads reviews, they say that that's a terrible way to end a book. Ambiguity is a, yeah, <laughs> ambiguity is a tough sell, particularly now. I don't I don't really know why, but I'll tell you also that in dealing with producers on film adaptations, they always say the same thing. Nah, we're not gonna do that. And I'm like, why though? I mean it's perfect. It leaves it leaves it up to the imagination. No, answer it. What's the answer? Explain it. And I hate that. I don't want to explain anything. <laughs> I don't well, and it's funny because I wonder if there's some kind of connection between commercial expectations and literary expectations and those of us who may lean towards more literary are happier with the ambiguous ending with the ending that doesn't exactly say okay spell out every little thing and make the connections for the reader who is too dumb to figure it out because I expect readers to be smarter and mm -hmm. I know that I've been told hey your commercial reader needs to be told xyz or they're just going to be like didn't get it this was a bad book and yeah. you don't want them to say this was a bad book but there's that balance and it sometimes it's that hard line to figure out, okay, am I going to be talking down to them because I'm sitting there with a Sharpie drawing the line for them and just writing over any kind of nuance and just, here you go. Here's Mark's a lot. Do you get it now? Well, it's a fine line because some people, you know, will say, and it's hard to argue it, that the writer just got to a point where they couldn't explain it themselves. <laughs> so they just went, eh, that <laughs> mystery retained. And other times, I did it. <laughs> yeah, and other times the ambiguity is the actual point. It's, you know, if the theme itself is about lack of resolution and you do it right, then the point is that you don't get any answers here either. But of course, you know, the literary experience is I go in and I have these events that they all need to lead to something. And it doesn't matter if you have this bombastic ending and you know the fates of the characters resolved unless you resolve the actual core mystery people leave unsatisfied you know and i see it myself when i go to see movies in the theater i will love how a movie ends with an ambiguous note and i'll hear everyone around me Ugh, what the hell was that ending about i'm like oh god this is my career <laughs> So do, do you ever feel like you're going to like succumb to the pressure and write like a cookie cutter ending one of these days? No, um, I already encountered it with an, a few editors who said, I get what you're going for here, but I think it would be more satisfying if you just did this. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not the story. That's not, if I do that, I'm doing that to, to kowtow to people, people's expectations. And I won't do that. I, because it just doesn't make any sense to me to do it that way. Now, does the editor go ahead and say, all right, I see what you're saying, or do you get a new editor, or what happens then? <laughs> no, I mean, I always take what the editor... I mean, editors are, are absolute invaluable to me. I, I love working with editors because frequently they will make a suggestion that alters the path I was on for the good, 
you know, and I would think, God, that's great. That that makes more sense. But every now and again, you'll come up against one where they're like, I don't know, I just think you should. And they don't say it, but what they're trying to convey is dumb it down for the reader. And when I hear that, I'm like, shut down. Nope. No way. Do you become I'd an angry get a, Irish man? I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather get a one-star review for an unsatisfying ending than a five-star review with a dumbed-down ending. Because everybody got it because it was so obvious. I hate that. Well, and I think that's the case with a lot of good books, because I think you'll find the books, at least the ones that I enjoy the most, are the ones that you'll find the five stars and the one stars, and maybe not a lot in the middle, because people people either loved it and thought it was amazing, or totally went over their head and they hated it. And I know I actually had, have been recommending a certain book, and someone reached out to me after I'd recommended it, and they're like, I still haven't decided if I hate it or not. Can you Can you explain yourself? So I had to basically go into apologetics for this other book that I didn't even write. This isn't even my book to explain. All right, let's talk through this. And I think by the time it was done, they'd kind of come around to see some connections that maybe they hadn't made already, but they were still sitting with it and had been at least a week since they finished and they were still pondering it. And I think for that, even if they came away still hating it, the fact they were thinking about it a week later, to me, that's a win. Yeah. And that's the thing. People have read my books and said, eh, you know, I liked this and this and this by that author, but this one was just a stinker. And I mean, you know, that happens. Everything you write is not going to resonate with everyone. Even if they're hardcore fans of yours, you'll always write a few that just eh, didn't do it for them. And there's nothing much you can do about that. The book is out there. You hope everyone will enjoy it while realizing and knowing in your heart and soul not everybody can or will. But then I've had people come back to me who wouldn't start a book on, of mine on Goodreads and 10 years later reread it and went, what the hell was I thinking? This is amazing. <laughs> and the reason they've said that is because for reasons known only to them, something from the book kept coming back to them mm. over the years. And they were like, you know what? I got to read that. Well, or what was that book from? What was that scene from? I keep thinking. And they'll go back and they'll reread it and go, oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't suck. <laughs> but the reverse, the reverse also happens. Someone will rave about a book and then a few years they'll reread it and go, eh. Wasn't as good as I remember it. <laughs> well, it's but funny. I don't know how many people actually reread books, especially if they were so polarized on it one way or the other. But yeah, I don't. I don't reread. I, I don't. I mean, I, I feel like I have too many on my plate to be spending time rereading stuff. But I know there there are some friends I have who like to reread the same books as like comfort objects. Yeah. But I can't yeah. think they would pick one that they hated as a comfort object. That doesn't really. That doesn't. I really hate this book. Let me read it again. See if I hate it just as much. <laughs> Yeah, hmm. it could be like, like, I don't think there's, you know, you can like rage watch a bad TV show or like rage watch a bad movie and just be like, oh, this is so stupid. I hate it so much. But I wouldn't waste time reading a book and screaming. Or it's like a TV show that starts out great and then in the midpoint starts to suck. Okay. And then there's more seasons and you're like, oh, I'm so done with this. And you sit there and you watch it anyway. And you're like, why? I hate this show now. Yeah. That there was are a couple that I've done. Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, yeah. It's the reason, I it's throw... the reason I don't. It's the reason I don't not finish books, even if I'm not enjoying it. I'll keep reading it because mm. I'm in it now. Yeah. I parked miles away. I you know, <laughs> might as well just hang around here for a while until the rain stops. But yeah, the only way out is through. So you just got to finish it. Yeah, it's, you have uh, yeah, to. closer to the exit than the entrance. So let's mm -hmm. just get it over with. And, and sometimes I, I do that and hope that there will be some kind of miraculous save at the end that the author pulls things together that you never saw coming and just wraps it in this gorgeous package. That has never happened once. <laughs> so I don't know why I keep deluding myself thinking, but maybe this time it's special. I, I think that too. And then I'll also say like, oh, but I've already read 200 pages and I can't mm -hmm. get that time back. So if mm -hmm. I just stop now, I've wasted that much time. So I'll just waste a little more time and at least be able to say I've finished it. And there's your story. What I'm thinking of doing at some point is writing a 600 page novel where 400 pages of it is absolutely the worst writing I've ever done in my life. And <laughs> then if somebody manages to get through it, at page 400, the entire plot to that point is revealed to be written by a shitty writer who gets murdered on page 400. The rest, <laughs> the rest uh, is solving his murder. <laughs> Best uh, writing I've ever done after that point. Uh, I'm there for that. You know, I'm not. And the only reason I say that is 
again, won't throw any particular authors under the bus. I, I read a book a couple years ago, loved it, got the sequel that I'd heard wasn't quite as strong as the first one. And I couldn't get through it. I was just, I was reaching out to the people who had read it and enjoyed the first one with me and said, please, can you tell me, does it get better? Is it because I'm listening to it instead of using my eyeballs? Am I missing stuff? And two of one, they all basically said, well, it's going to be basically nonsense up until the last maybe quarter of the book. And then it's really, really amazing. And I'd already put a couple hours into this and just went, I can't do it anymore. It's too painful. I don't even care enough. It could, it could end with fireworks and orgasms. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not reading anymore. And I know there's another book that it's set up for. And I've told everybody, look, if you want to read the third book, tell me how it goes. And if it's good enough, you can kind of give me the, you know, Cliff Notes, Notes version to tell me how it ended or tell me where to fast forward to. But it was, it was just too painful. It was like razor blades in my ears. See, I never, I never ask other readers what they think of books ever. Even writers, other writers I trust, I never take their verdicts of books seriously. Anyone. How come? Because they're not me. That's true. You know? So I've watched people online slam books by authors who I really enjoy and books I've really enjoyed and talk of books that were unpublishably, unpublishably bad. That's not a word, but it is now. It's a bad. word. It's a good word. Unpublishably? Yeah, it uh, looks like a C or a Q in the middle of it. So I don't trust it, partly because there's some kind of a, I don't know, there's a performative value, I think, in in reviewing now, which is not necessarily mm -hmm. a bad thing. Everything should be presented as entertainment. But I don't know, I see people get a lot, a, a little too much joy out of trashing books and a little too much enthusiasm in pushing them as well. So I never know in that C of quality what's to be taken seriously so i don't take any of it seriously it's not a slam on book doing it's a necessary thing but even my best friends when they tell me oh my god you should read this it's fantastic i won't do they know this and they just stop and go well keelan's not going to read it anyway i give no, up no no i tell them wow that sounds great i'll make a note of it and i'm not going to read it <laughs> like i'm not going to waste that moment in my brain remembering that i'm still just somebody who i kind of look for books nobody's talking about you know and these quiet little indie reads that one person will say, holy crap, this was great. And then why they thought it was great. And if something in there aligns with, you know, my tastes, I'll buy it probably in five years time, read it. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I am generally one of those who the bigger the buzz gets, the more likely I am running the other direction. Like, oh, everyone's talking about this. It is just off my TBR permanently. Even if it's in my preferred genre, don't care. It's going. But I, I also it, will it say sucks. that it sucks, though, because that's, that's the only way to be successful for the writer. <laughs> you know, we want we want, we want to be viral. Of, we want that level of buzz. But I mean, I, I, I know what you're talking about. It's kind of like, oh, my God, if I have to hear one more word about this book. But by that same token, I have publishers saying to me, oh, how many followers do you have on Twitter? Because once this yes. comes out, we're going to need you to be working 24. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I just want to write the books. But you can't have one without the other. You can love the romanticism of writing books all you want. But if you're not wanting to do the, the marketing side of it, then you're basically just talking to yourself. And you are very, very active on social media. And like your, your branding is great. Like, I hate to say branding in air quotes. But um, so too active. Is this your fault or because people are saying you need to be out there more? Yeah, it's a bit of both. I mean, I think if I didn't have to worry about the marketing side of it or an online presence, I wouldn't have any at all. I would I delete it all. Because honestly, it would do me a favor to be only able to concentrate on the writing. How these people yeah. manage to write seven books a year and they appear to be online twenty four hours a day as well. I I don't I don't get it. I'm pretty sure those seven books aren't books I want to read. Or they are, and then you want to murder them. <laughs> yeah. you're well, like, I, you I, are that good <sighs> well and i we're getting behind on some of the comments mostly because i don't want to interrupt but chad chad lesky has said he didn't realize how much he has in common with keelan until watching this and uh my friend laura just called me a hipster but she's way hipper than i am so she called you a hipster she called me a hipster i think i think she was just referring to the fact that if it's super popular i won't read oh, it yeah. and I, I was just going to clarify too that the reason i was asking friends about 
this particular book that I didn't want to get through was if I was just on the cusp of getting past this really nonsensical part, I would keep reading. But when they told me, oh, no, it's going to be like that for that much longer, I wasn't going to do the torture. Normally, I don't I don't check in with people as I'm reading it. I just read it unless it's Jen and I and we're like, are you done with the book yet? Because the guest is coming on tomorrow. And how far along are you? That's more of a buddy read than a, are you going to stop reading? I'm going to stop reading. This is terrible. That's, that's different. <laughs> Well, I have a book with a talking deer in it. I don't get to comment on ridiculous parts of other people's books. <laughs> I don't think a talking deer is per se ridiculous. Yeah, but it doesn't really have anything interesting to say. Oh, I was going to uh, say, what, is the, what does the deer have to say for itself? And uh, Kind of like me when he was horns. <laughs> there was a joke where we could have said something about being horny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. But this is not that kind of show. As you drink beer. <laughs> That's not the kind of show. We're well, that was, that was that was peer pressure or beer pressure because you guys were drinking. We're not drinking beer. We're, not drinking, we're beer. drinking bourbon. No, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our fault that you succumbed to weakness. Maybe a little. Maybe a little bit. Just a little. <laughs> if that was the case, then I would forever blame my own flaws on other people succumbing to weakness. So no, you're right. You got a point. I'm projecting. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. So what did Chad say? What do we have in common, Chad? I didn't he didn't say, so he's going to have to jump back in. I know, I know earlier he said something about how funny you are, so maybe he thinks he's very funny. But then he said, I had a very good point at some point. But there's always a little delay, so I'm not sure what point that was. So he may have to come back and tell me when I apparently made a good point, because that might be the first time that's happened. <laughs> in the history of our show, we I finally made, made a point. <laughs> Oh, I just saw it. I didn't realize I didn't have the comments tab hit. I was looking at, there was nothing. So I was like, where are you seeing all this? Now I see it. Yeah, okay. they'll pop up above where you're scrolling. So if yep. it shows up. So, well, what? In, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, in addition to obviously being a very prolific writer, you're also a cover designer. Mm. So is how do you balance that? Not well. <laughs> being an artist. <laughs> and Poorly. Poorly, yes, extremely. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. design your I mean, own covers? Mm, that's how I started designing book covers. I couldn't afford to pay people to do mine. When I first started like embracing the ebook revolution, I had something, I think, like 12 books ready to go because they'd been published previously in small press and stuff like that, but only in print. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna design the books themselves, but how much is it going to be to get all those covers done? And I started doing the research. I thought, nope. So I had some kind of, you know, basic skill with sketching and stuff like that. But what I did instead was I took, a, like, basically taught myself Photoshop over six months. Started messing around. And the first couple of covers I did, there, was, there were nothing spectacular, but they were better than a lot of what was out there. So. Well, there's a big variety of what's out there. So there's the bar for that yeah. could be pretty low. I'm just glad that. You were able to put something on it. Let's put it that way. Well, and I'm curious too, what happened as, as far as the covers that were on the print version, did you try to keep a similar tone or did you just go, well, I can't use those, so I'm going to do my own unique concept with each one? No, I wanted them to be different. Just, you know, not for any particular reason, I suppose, just to kind of, to distinguish the two, um, one from the other, kind of like foreign editions and stuff like that. I wanted this to be my own thing. And I wanted you to be able to recognize the consistency of design. But uh, yeah, so I started doing them myself and they got better as time went on. And then other people started asking me, who does your covers? And I was like, well, I do. I do this guy. Well, and Laura just said she thinks it would be fun to design your own covers because then it would be exactly what you want. And I think that is true that if you're doing your own cover, then you have full creative control. But yep. if you're like me, you would be like, I have a vision in my eye and it's never going to show up on paper because I have no graphic skills whatsoever. And it's just going to be like, hey, look, stick figures. Those are fancy. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the complexity of it, too. I mean, I have my limits. There's certain books that I've written that I know what I want for the cover. But trying to achieve that, I ended up just go, you know, what? I'm just going to put a friggin handprint on it. We're done. <laughs> Too complicated handprint. This is ridiculous. Now I'm trying to outdo myself. Not going to work. Too lazy. Move on. Next. Back to establishing that Keelan is too lazy to do it the way he wants. It's like, you will see there's a common theme. Yeah. It's, it's like laziness. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's also being efficient. If you're doing all this stuff and the covers, and if the point was, I've written this book and I want it out there, it's probably not best to waste all your time trying to do a cover, especially if when you're done, you're still like, this still isn't what I had in mind. Let's just cut to the chase and make it be acceptable rather than, eh, what, yeah. What and the cover, design work, the cover design work I do now is, there's so much of it, which is great. I mean, I can't complain, but it does, it does take up a lot of time. So like currently my agent is waiting on a rewrite of the new novel, which should be a case of sit down for a week, get it done and send it back. And that was a month ago. I still haven't gotten to it. <laughs> is your agent like, ha like hammering you every day? Like where no. are the pages? No, she trusts me to get it done, but she just said, you know what? Here you go. There's some notes. Uh, get that back to me and we'll go to to work. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to knock the cobwebs off it now. Well, does it, does it, are you the kind of person who hops between projects or are you going to have to get back into that one? Or is it just you haven't been writing at all for a while and it's going to be just remembering no how? No writing at all. I haven't written anything new in, I think, four months. Um, I have single pages of about eight things I've started, but. Then somebody will email and go, hey, where's my uh, where's my cover, potato stick? And I'm like, um. Did you just say it? potato stick? Potato stick. <laughs> what kind of a slam is potato stick? Make, make the potato stick. Oh, oh of it's course. It's terrible. <laughs> my Irish side is going to pretend to be offended and is not laughing at this. The rest pot. of me doesn't care. <laughs> my Irish side is laughing at that. That's fine. <laughs> I'm um, reading Chad's comment here. Love for ambiguity. Twisting readers and reviews supposed to be kicking on a giant. Then if you were right about. Yep. I'd have <laughs> so to he agree. Likes the he likes the ambiguity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, getting back to the house on Abigail Lane, it, it's not just the ending, which not going to spoil. The whole style is very unlike anything else that's for so much of it. And this is, this is not a slam, but it, it may sound like this. I kept waiting for the book to start. I kept waiting for the style to change and then yeah. it didn't. And then I realized, Oh, this is the book. This is how mm -hmm. the story is going to be. And it's going to proceed that way. And it's some kind of hybrid. I don't know how you describe it. Some kind of combination of found footage and documentary, but it's written as opposed to say a video, but you can easily kind of see how it would be if it were a video. And do, do we get it to come to video? Is it coming to video soon? Um, uh, maybe you're not allowed to talk about that. Just all right. Just, I, I, okay, I, I, widen your eyes really big. Just like, look like a hunting story, if, baby. Do the, backward, <laughs> do the backward seal clap if the answer is yes. <laughs> oh. Um, I can tell you that it is in. It's in development for TV right now. But I can't give you any specifics because. Oh. You could he you could hear me about to say, is it going to Netflix? <laughs> um, like once for Netflix, we... twice for Amazon Prime. <laughs> I don't know where it'll end up. Um, where we are in the process is contracts are signed. We have a writer attached to it. Next step, I think, is director. And after that, I don't know, filming, I guess. But we'll see. But the thing is, I've been in I've been at this point with a number of projects so many times over the years, only to have it turn around and go bluey. So I don't get excited about this stuff until I'm actually sitting there eating popcorn watching it and cashing the check. <laughs> Other than that, it's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm great. Okay, whatever you say. Call me when it's done. Well, that's fair because I can imagine going, oh, my show's going to be on. Oh, never, it's not. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Ten years, ago, 10 years ago, I posted Deadline's press release for Mike Flanagan's, uh, who was directing an adaptation of my story, Peekers. And I got astronomically drunk, called everyone I knew, told everyone I knew, holy shit, my life just changed. <laughs> I'm famous now. <laughs> Two years go by and the project collapsed. So, you know, that was the first and last time I got excited about movie adaptations because I have been on the phone with probably 20 producers in the past five years. Virtually everything I've written has at some point gotten an email from one of the big studios hey, uh, is this available? I'm like, yeah, it is. Oh, my God, I'll call you Friday. They call you Friday. Tell you you're amazing. All right, well, I'm going to get started on this then. I'm so excited. Bye. I like your... I hope I don't sound like that, but I like your valley girl. I know. I'm like, is that your California accent? I turn mine like, down when we're on here because I can get it pretty... 
I'm just telling you what they sound like, what they sound like. (laughs) So I just wanted to get on a quick call with you and uh, tell you that your story is amazing. Um, And I have a load of clients who'd be really interested in it. So I'm going to get in touch with them, probably not today because I have some meetings, but Monday. And after that, I will circle back to you maybe next month. How does that sound? I'm so excited. You're great, Kim. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) A year goes by. (laughs) Hey, so is this property property still available? I'm like, it is, yeah. (laughs) You know why? Because you never did anything with it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm mumbling. I have a gun in my mouth. <laughs> but it, just gets, got- it just gets frustrating because it's always the same process. It's the same language. It's the same uh, disproportionate level of enthusiasm. I'm telling you, you are just, oh, my God, there was no writer until you came along, and you were just the best of them all. <laughs> you were the very first who ever did. And I'm like, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Cool. 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 Bye. It's like next time ask them to put all compliments just in the memo line of the check when you cash it. And until then, just hold on. Just what I don't understand is when they the email you to ask if it's available and tell you why they liked it and what they'd like to do with it. Why do they then have to call you to tell you exactly what they had already said in the email? Guys, I'm being totally serial. That's why. They need to make sure nobody they know. wants to talk on the phone. Oh, I know. Not writers. What is this, 1982? I, I don't want to do that. Well, so what does get you excited? So if you're not getting excited when these people tell you how amazing you are, because even though you know you're amazing, but you also know that their their likelihood to follow through is about a two out of a hundred. What gets you excited now? What gets me excited? I am um, incredibly excited about two projects that are coming up. That you uh, can't what? talk about. <laughs> can we I, have an? Don't experience? tell him he can't talk about it. Let him talk about it. And if he realizes later he can't, then he can just go. Oops. One is a one is a limited edition collection, and the other is a graphic novel that I wrote. So I'm very excited about both of those. Um, I can't really say much about that, but I get more excited about writing projects. Um, Blanky was actually another one that came this close to being a feature film from a director I really like, and it pretty much got the same reaction from all the major studios that you gave it, which is like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm a parent. I'm not doing this. Sorry. So, yeah. So I get kind of excited when I, when I connect with people in any, to any degree in this business, whether it's film or whether it's graphic novels or whether it's books, I get very excited when I connect with people who want to work with me, who have that passion and aren't just, saying it so they can get the rights to do something when they're when they connect with you and they're like oh my god we got to do this or we're going to explode and i'm like yes yes come on let's do it so that process for me where you have to sit down with the idea and figure out all the angles and where it's going that excites me starting a new novel excites me finishing one excites me what about that whole middle part of the the what the hell is going on in this book part every time every time that's just i'm a fraud i'm done goodbye that's it. I saw I saw a meme. I want to say it was either yesterday, or the day before, and I felt very called out. And it said we had to write all of the sentences in the book, like yeah. what I all of them. They don't tell <laughs> you, that you. You, have write, you have to write the whole thing. Like even the boring parts, even the yeah, even the well, info dumps. Oh. Right now, there's there's so many places in my work in progress that just say elaborate or describe, and half of what I'm doing is just moving sentences until they make some sort of sense. So. I mean, I know I'll have to write more of them, but right now I just want to rearrange them. Yeah, rearranging yeah, is better. Absolutely. It's like Jenga. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I sing when I do it, like the Tetra song. Do, 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 Till it's English, because right now it's questionable. See, I really. just write until like maybe something happens, but sometimes, I mean, this is why the show's called Word Vom, and I just like <laughs> sit there and I'm like, I don't know when the plot is going to happen. I don't That's know when, when, when the crimes are going to happen. I don't know well, when the people are going to die. I don't know. And there are times she's texting me to go, yeah, this whole chapter probably has to go because, it, and it's too bad because I love it. And I just tell her, if it does, it does. But let me read it first, please. I know. I'm like, yeah. just wrote a whole chapter about she cake and a cockatiel. Is that going to be in the final draft of this book? I can't imagine my agent saying yes. I hope not. <laughs> I hope that's the title of the book. <laughs> there you go. Do you have a title yet? Because there you go. I have a title. 
that it's I'm not, not sheet cake. It's in the not sheet. No, but I can't uh, even say cockatiel. Cockatiel. That's no, and that that's word. the that's the name of the chapter. No. <laughs> the most recent novel. I'm excited about that too. Um, I sent it to my agent, and it's it's one of the most personal things I've ever written. So I didn't know if that blinded me to its quality, because I just basically bawled my eyes out into the entire thing instead of typing the words. Oh. And when it was done, I was just wrecked. I thought, can't I can't figure out if this is good or not. I don't know what it is. So I sent it to my agent, and it's the first book I've sent to my agent. She's represented a, a couple of uh, movie deals and things for me, but she hadn't. I hadn't written a new novel in six years, so I sent it to her, and man, half the pandemic passed, and I didn't hear anything. I was like, oh, God, oh, she's, no. she's too nice to tell me it sucks banana balls. But so uh, she finally got back to me and it was, we should talk on the phone. And I'm like, oh, geez. No. no. So when she's you're afraid she's going to be like, we need to and, talk. Uh, I was like, like we, we can't, she's, we she's can't talk on the phone. We can't do it. All the phone lines are down everywhere. Um, and I'm on fire. Um, and about to die. So I can't. But thanks anyway. So I did. I got on the phone and man, it was amazing. It was well, basically a deconstruction of the entire thing. And uh, best thing I've written, apparently. So I'll take it. Is that what she's having you make revisions on now? Yeah, she had a couple of notes for me on it that were absolutely fantastic. I mean, they were just, it was stuff I should have been able to see, but I was in there and I could, I wasn't paying as much attention to structuring and I was just word vomiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like but, uh, just feeling it, living it, all the angst. All well, if it's yeah. so personal, mm -hmm. I can totally see how it may be too hard to think of it as an actual product that needs to be formed because it's just this thing coming out of you. You can't form that, but someone else next to you can go, this is gorgeous, but let's just polish it here and here, yeah. and now it's ready. Yeah, and there's, you know, the whole, wow, aren't these passages lovely? Oh, yes, they are, but what purpose do they serve? Snip, snip. No. Well, yeah. yeah. Give, your no. book, give your book a vasectomy and we'll talk. <laughs> it's not what it's supposed to be doing. It's like a haircut, not a vasectomy. Bad I, I always refer to vasectomies as the snips, so it made sense to me. The snips. That, sounds, that sounds like a congestion problem. I got the snips. Hold on. I got the snips. I, 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 get, I, get yeah. to work I got the snips. <laughs> well, and I was just laughing when you were talking about the writing through these deep emotions because there is a program that little kids learn to learn how to do proper writing and it's writing without tears. And we're like, no, no, this is writing through the tears. Bring that on. Cause if it's something that comes from that place in your heart, we want you to be having gone there when you wrote it so that we can go there when we read it. Yeah. Well, and the thing is like, it has a commercial through line. It looks like a missing persons type thing, a child going missing. Mm -hmm. and it looks like just, you know, fairly standard tropes. But it takes a kind of a weird turn about 100 pages in that changes the dynamic of it. And for me, it was basically just taking my entire childhood and bringing that out into the into the book. And it's good. It got intense, though. I had to, I had to walk away from it a couple of times because I was really old with it. You know? Were you writing it during the pandemic, too? The pandemic is probably the only reason it got done. Mm. Because hey, I had the one good thing out of the pandemic, new novel. The pandemic was, for me, out of necessity, the most creative time in my life, I'd say, but at least 10 years. I got more done in that year of lockdown, or pandemic, than probably the last 10 years combined. I just, I escaped into it. I, I couldn't bear this whole not being able to live real life anymore, and people were, friends of mine were having a hard time, and it was, so I just opened the door, went into the novel and shut it behind me. It stayed there, it came out, and it was done. I love that. Yep. Well, then I want you to do your revisions and send those back to your agent because I want to read this book. And yes, means... Mom. <gasps> I just got Mom. <laughs> you did just get Moms. Only my dog calls me Mom in dog language. <laughs> I'm not well, sure just... I can take that. Well, and I was I was just laughing when you said what happened to the, the child. I'm like, did it end up in blanky? Because that's not going to end well either. <laughs> that's the twist. 
That's a twist. It's Blanky all along. <laughs> no, actually, Blanky was inspired by something that happened to um, to a couple I know, and I had to. Uh, I kind of conferred with them before I wrote it to see if that was cool. But it's one of these things that is particularly difficult to discuss now. Is where people say I, writers shouldn't write about. When I hear that, I'm done. I'm like, I don't want to hear the rest of your sentence. I don't care what it is. I don't want to hear it. What you're saying is, I don't want to read books about, and that's different. That is your choice, and I completely understand that 100%. I wouldn't want to read certain books about certain things. That's personal choice. Fine. But every single day I get on social media, somebody else is saying writers shouldn't write about. Now, are they saying no writer should write about it, or are they saying, because I've seen very, very prevalent right now is, X type of writer shouldn't be writing about X type of situation. Like if you that's didn't different. live it, yeah. you no, don't that's get different. it. I get that and I agree with that too. Yeah. No, that's not what it is. The is sentence is the writer language? shouldn't write about. about and then certain about topics. Children, is, killing a cat. And you put in parenthetically after that, you yeah. put in thing reader doesn't like person. Right. Yeah. And I, it just, ugh. I Which never is kind of funny because. I mean, everybody says never kill the dog, and John Wick made a lot of money killing off that dog. So, yeah, but everybody likes Keanu Reeves, so he gets away with it. That is true. Not yeah. everybody, but enough people do. <laughs> enough people like him. I hate to cut this short, but we are oh. actually out of time. Whoa, that's a lot of words, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I read it real fast or no? You can. Okay. <laughs> Chad says. RE, in common, our love for ambiguity and not wanting to break out the crayons or spoon feed the reader, as well as not trusting readers or reviews on which books you'll enjoy. I can be picky on what I enjoy and have read plenty that people rave about that are definitely unpublishable. Also, I've done several of my own covers and I'm part Irish. He He's your long lost um, right there. I feel like Chad better. just wrote you like a love letter yeah. right here live on our Chad show. Chad knows I love him. He knows I love him. Chad, Chad has been on our show. We love Chad, so... I'm glad. Thank you, Chad, for tuning in. Uh, and thank Thanks, you, everybody Chad. who is watching us live and who is going to be watching yeah. us on the replay. Make sure you check out all of Keelan's books. House on Abigail Lane, just be prepared. You're going to end up scared of sunflowers, but okay. it's worth it. Or at least looking at them with a little bit more suspicion. I don't know if you're scared of yeah. them. Let's not, let's not be I'm just like freaking people out unnecessarily. Them. Creeped out yes. by them. Um, so Unless thank they you. have an eye in them. Yeah. Oh, no, that is something I do not enjoy. <laughs> Nothing with eyeballs. So um, anyways, on that note, <laughs> thank you to Pam Stack and everybody at the Global Authors on the Air Radio Network. Thank you to Roman Sirotin, our producer. This has been a copywritten podcast by Global Authors on the Air. Stay tuned next week when we have author of The Happiness Thief, Nicole Bo Bola, Bo Bo Bocat, Bocat. Bo Bocat. Bo I don't know if it's Bocat or Bocat, but I know. Yeah. I was like, I know I'm going to say her last name wrong. And uh, you can also tune in tomorrow when I'm going to be hosting Writers Showcase with the author of The Cult of Dracula, Richard Davis. So thank you, and we will see you all next.